<laughs> but look at Charlie Smith. He is slightly shorter than Frodo. And that dude calls in more elk than who'd have thought it. it could be now, me, I have to run him down. Not because I can't call, because I'm a 17-time world champion caller. But it's they know that's a big opposing force behind that bugle. So then I have to run him down. Uncompagre or... That's the unpronounceable. <laughs> but the Argali, even I could spell, it's just... <laughs> Our golly. So even if I have to like hook on phonics it, <laughs> like our golly, that's how it comes out. So oh. you're good. <laughs> you want me to answer that one? Yeah, dude. Scab at it, man. As far as the pattern goes, you can make fun of all of them. It, we call it. <laughs> I'm making fun of my companies too. So, so nobody get all pissed off over this. We call it, uh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Now, if it makes you feel tougher, put it on. Fusion, <laughs> cucumber. That's the cucumber pattern. Um, I'm about to get invaded in Montana from Russians <laughs> and Red Dawn. If you're only posting the breathability ratings off this layer before it's all glued together and camouflaged, you are a liar. That is not correct. <laughs> and we have found that... As soon as you post this, my email box is going to start filling up from what I just said. <laughs> Hello. All right. You're listening to the Gritty Bowman, home of Gritty bow hunting films, interviews, tall tales, and a wee bit of manly boasting. I'm South Cox, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is Corey Jacobson, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. We bone and raised outdoors, <laughs> and you've been listening to the Gritty Bowman. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I'm Casey. And I'm Jordan. And you're watching <laughs> The Gritty, Gritty Bowman. Bowman. <laughs> On this episode of Gritty Bowman, Aaron and I were supposed to talk about ethical shot distance, but instead we got sidetracked on a few tangents and completely left the reservation. In this podcast, we actually talk about hunting industry camo patterns. Aaron makes a few jokes, no offense intended. We talk about what's going on at Kefaru lately, and we promise that our next podcast will, in fact, cover ethical shot distance. Please excuse the poor audio quality of my microphone in this podcast. I screwed up. If you like the show, please go to our website at grittybowman.com and subscribe to this podcast and tell your mates and pals about us. Do us a favor and please take a moment to leave us a rating or a review on iTunes or on our YouTube channel. Send your questions and podcast ideas to grittybowman at gmail.com. If you're listening to this on iTunes, you can see the video version of this podcast on our website at www.grittybowman.com. Calm. All right. All right, folks. Uh, welcome to the Greedy Bowman Podcast. Aaron Snyder and I are back. Uh, we are going to talk about um, something. Well, we're going to talk about ethical shot distance, which we said we were in the last podcast, but um, we rambled on too long on the other subject. So it happens. Yeah. I mean, squirrels and all. So <laughs> um, before we get started, I wanted to uh, bring up uh, a clarification for Cousin Ben. Uh, he heard his podcast where we, Anthony and I, he wasn't there to defend himself while we talked about our hunt. And uh, so, you know, you got Anthony's perspective and my perspective on how it went. Well, Cousin Ben felt like we left out some key details that um, sh should have been mentioned. One was that he actually did use his cow call on the bull he killed. He did use it, redeem himself. He did call to that elk right at the last moment, got it to stop, and then shot it, which is something he failed to do on the first first uh, couple <laughs> encounters. So he wanted that uh, shared. He wanted uh, people to know that, um, you know, he's a little, he made the mistake at the beginning, but not, not there at the end. Um, I never saw it, so I don't know if he's telling the truth or not. But um, You're Mormon. You have to tell the truth. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> Uh, the next thing, um, Aaron, um, you had some guys visit your shop during yeah. the, the season, um, about, you know, just to say, Hey, listening to the podcast, really appreciate it. Came by to say hello. And I get a lot of emails, uh, a ton. You do too, per PMs every day for the podcast. And, uh, 
we, I just wanted to say thanks to everyone that's out there that's sending us notes and, and we read every single one of them. The ones that I get, I always forward to you. Um, but, uh, I don't always get a chance to respond to them because it's, I got, uh, I'm just busy, um, between my real job. Well, my real job, my job that uh, pays me a wage <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, my family and, and then hunting and everything else. So I try, I try my best to get back to, to folks, but, um, a lot of guys have been leaving us comments about or questions about podcast topics. And, uh, so you and I have some podcast topics down the road that we're going to cover, um, as soon as we can, including, yes. um, uh, a big one that people ask about all the time is navigation and orienteering. Um, we're going to try. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a tough it's, one to do on the forum or on a podcast. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would say, yeah, a big thank you for the support on my end is from the guys coming into the shop to the messages, whether it be don't worry about the haters or just thanks for everything you do or stories about stuff we've talked about and where they've succeeded and, you know, even fitness stuff where guys have lost a bunch of weight. All that's we get all of that. And I'm in the same boat as um Brian. I read every one and I suck bad at replying to all of them so if i have not replied i i appreciate the support and um and blame it on my lack of ability to type fast and i <laughs> i'm sorry but i i do appreciate the support for sure uh one of the i was just going over because aaron doesn't really read the the reviews on itunes but uh so i'll go and share them with him every now and then um and uh one of the ones that we just got was from uh just just a well, just a few days back from uh, John Hetland. I think that's how you say it. He said, I was on my way back from a hunting trip and was listening to your podcast with Corey Jacobson about his tactics for calling out. A week and a half later, I went back into the woods and did exactly what he said. Soft cow call and then cut the bull off with a challenge bugle and a five point bull came in in a matter of seconds. Long story short, his horns are in my garage and my freezer is full. Can't thank you enough for such valuable info. What an unbelievable experience. First elk, solo, backcountry, Colorado. Just pretty sweet. Uh, it, you know, interestingly, I use that, uh, we use that same technique. We hadn't really called elk like that very often. We just challenge bugled them right off the bat, but we never really worked on doing like the soft cow call thing first, like Corey Jacobson recommended. Um, and kind of, you know, just easing a bull into bugling. And then when that bull goes off and, and bugles toward the cow, you cut him off with an ornery, uh, challenge bugle. Well, we, we did that this year and a bull just came charging in, um, faster and more reckless than we've ever had happen before. In the past, we would cow call and bugle a bunch and cow call. And, and usually if a bull came in, he kind of, you know, cautiously came in, was looking around. It was just night and day, the difference. So it was pretty cool to see that work. I think Corey calls an elk because I think elk know they don't, you know, size wise, Corey's not exactly an opposing <laughs> figure, right? Like he's smaller. Oh. And, and that's why he calls in more elk than me because <laughs> the elk know that's a big dude behind that bugle. Oh. And Corey's so little. Yeah, it has nothing to do with his ability to call better than me. It's the size behind the bugle. But look at Charlie Smith. He is slightly shorter than Frodo. And that dude calls in more elk than who'd have thought it, right? I mean, they come running in. True. I think it's because Charlie, one, he's a ginger. Two, he's only five foot two. You, and they just know there's no there's no threat behind that bugle. And then he shoots them. That could be it. That could be Now, it. me, I have to run him down. Not because I can't call, because I'm a 17-time world champion caller, but it's they know that's a big opposing force behind that bugle, so then I have to run them down. Not because I scared them off from my calling. They just know. Yeah. That's, that's my good, theory. I, I'd stick with that. That You should yeah. keep that. Um, <laughs> by the way, uh, on the whole note about um, watching or, or reading reviews – um, I'll screenshot some of these and send them to you. So they're just spoon fed to you and you can see some of the cool comments on iTunes. Um, 
But uh, I was just checking my email before the podcast, and I saw that you sent out a notice that uh, Kifaru has like three new packs. Yeah, and um, and I I've seen some videos you post, but I never watch them um, <laughs> on uh, new packs and stuff. So why don't yeah. you just? I don't want to go back and watch your videos and all that. So why don't you just give me a rundown? What is it that you guys just put out? Well, I mean, we purposely, which you've urged me to talk about Kafaru a couple times on here, and I don't want it to become a Kafaru podcast, so that's why I don't talk about the packs much. But you're asking me, so I'll talk. So we yes. have three I new mean, it packs. Is, it is new. This is not like uh, – and I genuinely – here's the thing is I am uh, – I already got a pack, and I really yeah. like it, and uh, it – it costs a small fortune, but it's going to last forever. And it's <laughs> awesome. And so, uh, which I have that, uh, the new frame with the duplex. Um, but I'm not going to um, really shop for a new one anytime soon because yeah. I got one. But yeah. then again, you guys come out with some new crap and then I want one. I know, right? But yeah. I will say we, we're done coming out with large new crap um, <laughs> because – we, with a few twists and turns aside and me learning from users, not, you know what I mean? Like sometimes as far as in the design portion of the pack, it doesn't really matter what I want because I get them free. Yeah. I mean, it does to a certain degree as far as I have a good idea of what will work, but taking a lot of uh, the users and testers, these packs were designed back straight from feedback. Um, but my own, but more so from a lot more of the users and and just guys that have already run other packs. So there, the, it's the three packs, and it's the uh, Argali, which is the largest, the Markor, and the Tar, which those are all sheep and goat species. Um, the Argali is about seven thousand cubic inches. It's just a straight. It's a. It's a. Go ahead. Let me stop you real quick. Um, the Argali, the Markor, yeah. and the what? Tar and the tar. Now, have you been hanging out with Kenton too much um, at first light? Because it seems like uh, you guys like to name them things that no one can pronounce. You know. Well, like, that one uh, was bad. I, so we took my. It's not as bad as Uncompagre or. That's the unpronounceable. <laughs> but the Argali, even I could spell. It's, just, it's Argali. So even if I have to like hook on phonics, it like. <laughs> Argali. That's how it comes out. So oh. you're good. Oh, cool. Okay. The tar, even if you spell it wrong, you'll get there. But instead of my Oregon education from Detroit Lake would be T-A-R, but it's actually spelled T-A-H-R. Anyway, but they're they're rams and goat species. Sweet. Um, <laughs> quite frankly, we couldn't come up with a different name. <laughs> they're all taken. Those two weren't, <laughs> damn it. Um, all the cool uh, names are gone. It's hard to find. A, so are the uh, representative of the species, like the tar is pretty small. So is that a smaller pack? Yeah. And the Argali is really big. It's a, it's a very large ram. Um, That's okay. I, I'm and I'd never it. even heard of a Markor. Uh -huh. uh, it's this crazy <laughs> squirrely horned ram or a goat. I should probably know that it's a goat, which I, I don't even know if you can hunt them, but it looked cool. And it was the name <laughs> of a ram or a goat. So we named it that. But so... The Argali is, uh, we took the high camp, which is a pack we offer now, and took the feedback from it. And it did kind of look short and stubby. So we made these more of a little bit more of a tube type of a pack. Um, same size all the way up. We put three sewn in compression straps uh, on it. And then we left it pretty much naked. There's no bottom zipper access. There's no, you know, it's just a top loader. But then we also came out with a new spotting scope pocket, which you can hook to the back of it. You can hook three belt pouches on the bottom of it. The idea, idea being with the new ultralight duplex um, or ultralight hunting frame, you can, that's two pounds, 14 ounces. And then the um, Argali's two pounds, or excuse me, one pound, 13 ounces. You know, you're at a 7,000 cubic inch pack that's extremely lightweight. Um, and it compresses the way that I put the compression straps on it when you're day hunting, if you have a spotting scope pocket on the back, you can compress the main bag completely flat like an accordion. And 
there's some photos from the the sheep hunt we were uh, the goat hunt we were on as well as some other scouting trips when we were doing the final testing that people can see but that's the argali um it looked pretty sweet with that uh i did see the spotty scope um attachment and that was a facebook hit i noticed uh you got a million questions right off the bat like how can i get one of those yeah it's it's and it's a really it's a solid pack like it's one I'll probably use it more than anything now because one, it's so freaking lightweight. Like I had 10,000 cubic inches in my bag, my pack with pockets and I was at like six pounds and you know, that's pretty hard to do. And then the, the Markor, which is the next smaller one. Yeah. It's just like the Argali, but smaller in circumference, smaller in height. Um, that's good for like, you could do seven days with it. I can't, I can only do about four because of camera gear and everything, you know, but it's it's more like forty five to forty eight hundred cubic inches. Uh-huh. Um, the thing that's nice about that, if you have the guide lid, the spotting scope pocket, uh, and, and and the attachments, it is a pretty dang good day pack. You can detach it and use the actual bag for a load shelf. You, know, you can do the same thing with the Argali. But they're a very slick system. But if you want to add like three belt pouches on the bottom of it for pocketization, and that spotting scope pocket. Once you compress the main bag down, you, you can have, you know, three belt pouches and one spotting scope pocket. Or for those ultra light, like the weight weenie guys that really are weight conscious, uh-huh. you can have a super durable 500D Cordura pack and be with the duplex frame or the platform frame, the hunting frame. You can be under five pounds, well under five pounds. And that's the, I used the ultra light frame when we carried out Colton's bull and it, that's a 178 pound load. We weighed it because I knew people wouldn't believe us anyway um, for eight miles. And that was with the ultralight frame and a prototype bag. And I'm still using it now. I mean, that's, you know, the only reason why I went to a different bag on the, the goat hunt or whatever yeah. is we changed a couple of the uh, positions on the, the, the straps, the um, like the compression straps. And it's pretty hard to tell what I was using because it was in infusion. So we actually made a wolf gray pack and I put Typhon pockets on it for the goat hunt because it, it accentuates, I guess my daughter would say, that the different pockets, you can tell the difference. Yeah. Uh, so that's the Argali and the Markor, pretty slim down packs that can be extremely versatile. Now the tar is the one we put the most work into just because a lot of guys wanted a, it, it's basically a 3,400 cubic inch pack. Um, where the snow collar can be used as a lid. So you can take the actual lid, the, the lid or, or excuse me, the collar of the pack, fold in the front side, and then there's tab loops on the part that's towards your neck, and then yeah. the vertical straps buckle into that. And and we figured out the size. It's actually a little bit bigger than 3,400 if you were to expand it, but then the lid, obviously it doesn't work. We figured out the size with the lid folded over as far as you could fill up the bag and still close the snow collar as a lid but then you can run an actual like a guide lid on it um you can also run nine belt pouches on it or three spotting scope pockets it's extremely versatile it's a smaller pack that you can use as a day pack Mm -hmm. but it also has a sewn-in meat shelf which i'm not personally a big fan of except for on smaller packs i don't and i mentioned that before it doesn't really matter it's sewn in. There's a pocket for it. So you can hook the tar on the 26, 24, or the 22-inch frame. The load shelf works equally well on all those frames. Um, and and it basically lets you have a day pack that you can have a decent amount of stuff in, expand away from the frame, put your quarter in, or you can use it for a three- to five-day like bivy pack. And once you get back there, like if you went in there with three spotting scope pockets, because that gives you an extra 3,000 cubic inches. Uh-huh. Um, you can detach those and have a s- extremely low profile, <laughs> lightweight day pack. Um, so that's the tar. It's one pound. Don't quote me on this. 13 or 14 ounces. Um, that's with all compression straps. You can slim it way down. That's with three compression straps and up and over the top strap, thing like that. We just send out a ma- sent out a mailer on them. Um, I foresee that tar probably being our largest seller. We put, and the Argali and the Markor, not that difficult to design. They're a high camp. We change the sizes a little bit. But the tar, with that expanded meat shelf, having it fit on all three frames, and the snow collar working as a lid, being 
able to attach a lid quickly, detach a lid, and then use the snow collar as a lid. There was a lot of variables we wanted, but the biggest thing is we wanted to keep it so simple anyone could use it, but also the ability for somebody overly complex, someone like me that always customizes their packs, the ability to do that but not have the complication of it, where if you send a kit of 15 straps, like on a cargo panel, guys get confused. This comes ready to go out the door, straps are on it. But like uh, Russ Meyer, he's a guy that's been testing it, and he immediately got it. He was like, well, can't I take this strap off and put this here and do this? And I'm like, yeah, that, that's the idea. Most people don't ask that question, but you can exactly do that. And what he wanted to do was, with the tar – go in with the, the bag on the frame like normal, couple side pocket or spotting scope pockets, head in for a three, four day hunt. And then if he, he kills something, to actually use a different set of compression straps to strap the uh, quarter or the dew bone meat straight to the frame. So you're taking straps around that, buckling them in the middle, and then lightly compressing the bag on top of that so it's not really getting squished. You can do that with the tar easily or you can use the tar as a compression bag as well so the video if you take a look at the video there's a ton you can see what i'm talking about on all this but those are the the three new ones okay and the video is on kafaru's website basically yeah kafaru.net okay well that sounds pretty cool that that tar sounds pretty neat so uh what do you think you're going to run for shed shed hunting the tar Okay, and then what do you think you'll run for like a an elk hunt? Um, like a backpacking elk hunt? Yep. Pretty much it's already I already did it, like I did it all season. So I ran the um the Argali for the big trips. Yep. Um I ran the Markor for all the scouting trips, and then I ran the tar for pretty much anything for photography. We have to be in ninja mode for a lot of this stuff because our you know, if I post a photo, those photos get expanded a lot and guys will look through what i have attached and several guys immediately when i posted a photo that i didn't think anybody could tell what i was running knew immediately (laughs) it probably was not it was something i was testing but that was the markor um the tar we never took a photo of in eight months of testing it not one like so i was (laughs) like i just never brought the camera gear because We've never built an expanded meat shelf pack because I don't like them. Um, so I wanted to make sure. Well, the Rambler is an expanded meat shelf pack, but it, it works a little bit differently than this. Um, but we never built one quite like this. And so I wanted to make sure it was perfect and something I could say, yeah, I would use that um, in comparison to some of the other packs I've used on the market with the meat shelf, it takes 45 minutes to actually make the meat shelf work and it does more harm than good. I wanted to make sure I could say with this one, yep, takes about two minutes, works real, you know, pretty easy. It is cool to be able to uh, strap the meat to the frame the way you're describing, like um, compression strap it. Like, you know, I can drop, drop it in my bag right now. Um, I mean, if, if I feel the entire bag, it's about as much weight as I could possibly carry uh, if I fill it with meat and then strap it all down. Um, and with the tag bags, with the tag bags being tall, the bomb bags, you can actually, you know, they, they keep the meat in the right shape. So, yeah. so they don't just, it doesn't all just slide to the bottom of your bag in a giant ball. It'll keep it upright and then in the right place. But if you didn't have those kind of bags, and then you're sitting there trying to strap your bag down, having the ability to use compression straps to like put it exactly where you want it up your back, you know, on the frame. That's nice. Yeah, it, it's handy. And I'm just to go over, which was one of the clarification questions that I was going to answer. I don't dislike meat shelves with small bags. I don't I don't have any problem with them. I don't mind them with a big bag if there's nothing in the big bag. My issue with the meat shelf, using my pin as a diagram, if you have me and my pack on, and then you have your main normal tube full, um, if I just put the meat in my main bag along with all my gear, 
it's not extending off of my back, pulling me backwards. If I put 80 pounds of deboned meat between the frame and the bag, and then I have seven days of gear in the bag using like, you know, the lines on the sheet of paper, you're just going to keep dragging that away from my back. And that's why you'll see guys hunched over and how a lot of those Fultons with Colt photos with Colt and he had 180 plus pounds on. He's not really hunched over. That's because it's all in the main bag, the heaviest part up against the center of my back. And, and again, up against my back rather than some heavy stuff against my back and then some still relatively heavy stuff, 12, eight, whatever inches away. With a small bag, it's a moot point because there's not enough to really yank you you backwards. And I can understand the concept for day hunting completely or for an overnight or a quick trip to use an expanded meat shelf. But if you're going in for a uh, – I say this and not irritate people. For those of you who sent me messages saying, can you sew on an expanded meat shelf to a DT1? That scares me because Kafaru's name is on it, and that's comfort, right? That's what we pride ourselves on. If we th- sew an expanded meat shelf without a giant warning label, do not use this when your bag is full, someone will do it. That person will tell his friends that Kafaru was horribly on. Un- Paul Medell, the elk nut, he did it. He put a freaking – I don't even want to get into that with Paul, but he put a quarter in a shelf – and then put another quarter in the bag and then strapped another quarter to that or something on a bikini frame. And he's like, man, this was really uncomfortable. I'm like, yeah, I bet it was. And well, you, you can't extend that much stuff off your back. Uh, just like fitting the pack correctly, loading it correctly ma- makes all the difference. Um, yeah. And uh, I think what basically all you're saying, though, is is with a cer- if you're if you have a backpack full of gear – and then you stuff meat in between the frame and that bag, you're going to be falling over backwards. And well, then, you're um, going to be hunched over to not fall over backwards. Right. And, and that's not a, a – uh, that's not the best way to load your pack and to carry that load. And the easiest way I explain people to do it that it is very gimmicky and it is, it is niche, this, this load shelf, mm-hmm. is test it. Take a, a pillow, a, you know, cover and throw that pillow cover full of beans or throw a 50 pound and only 50 pounds, which isn't much. Um, you know, it's usually closer to probably 70 to 80 of deboned meat, but 50 to 80 pounds. Expand your pack with all your gear away in four days of food. Expand that away from your frame or our frame, whoever's you want to try, and then throw that 50 to 80 pound bag, strap it all back together you know, using the expanded meat shelf and go walk a mile, come back, pull some of your gear out of your main bag, put it back on the frame. Normally drop that sandbag into your main bag, put as much as you can back in there and strap your tent on the outside and then go walk around. There's, it's not an argumentative point. It's more comfortable having it in the main bag. That's not my opinion. That's fact. I mean, that's, we've tested it. Multiple people have tested it. And so the expanded meat shelf for, for larger packs to me, is not a good idea. And the draw, the, the only, there's only two things I can think of for having an expanded meat shelf. One is just so you don't get blood all over your stuff. Yeah. And, uh, that can be achieved just by using a contractor bag, garbage bag, um, yeah. just in your kit, just drop it in your contractor bag and it's going to keep your, your, uh, your bag clean Two, yeah. two. Uh, the other reason I could see using it is simply to try to keep the meat, um, from just piling in a giant ball at the bottom of your pack. It, it just, it's a little easier to strap it to the frame, uh, correctly. Um, but that can be achieved by using better game bags. Yeah. Or conscientious loading. Yeah. Like if you cinch up some of those straps on your pack a little tighter before you load the meat in there. And then you do have compression straps on the outside of your bag, which you can tighten to keep the meat from sliding down. Uh, but it certainly is a lot easier because this is the first year I've used other game bags besides like just cheap ones that, you know, like, a you know, using those tag bags as bomb bags, as boned out meat bags. 
it made it so much easier to load the pack. This year, for example, um, you know, we've been on several different hunts and very, very, several successful hunts where we're packing out meat. A um, couple of sheep, a couple of goats, four elk, a couple of mule deer, right? Um, one of the elk hunts, which was recently, I got a phone call late at night. Hey, will you come help me pack out an elk? Um, anyway, I got in there. He had the, uh, the expanded meat shelf. Heard all about it on the way in. You know what I mean? How awesome it was. And um, not to piss off any haters or whatever, but I literally was laughing because I came in with overnight kit because it was late, right? And uh, got it up, got the elk literally completely deboned, hung in trees and in the bomb bags. Um, I put all my soft stuff. I knew I'd be hot. So my, my puffy jacket and everything else in the bottom. And this was in uh, the Mark or yeah, the Mark Corps. I took the bottom compression strap of the Markor. Once all my soft goods were in the bottom, I tightened it as tight as it could go, which completely pinches off the bag. Exactly. So it can't slide any further down. I took two D-bone game bags, slid them side by side, with you know, into the bag, laid it down, put my knees on it, cranked the straps as tight as I could, took the lid, put it over the top, put the vertical straps, cranked those as tight as I could, threw the pack on and down the trail. And you're Somewhere overnight. Around, you're overnight. Of, what's that? Oh, okay. In your overnight gears, like in the bottom or in the guide lid, or just basically, I had a bivy sack and a yeah. and a sleeping bag. Yep, and then I had my clothing down there too. So right now, my main bag, I got my little survival kit, some gloves, yep. headlamp, water purifier. Mm -hmm. So somewhere between twenty and fifty yards, I realize I'm solo, not paying attention because it's three in the morning <laughs> and uh, or two. Turn around, go back up the trail, and I'm like. Dude, what are you doing? You look like a monkey humping a football with that thing. He's like, hold on, I'm trying to get the shelf to work right. And I'm like, what do you mean get the shelf to work right? So the way that it worked with the expansion of the, you know, the compression straps and everything, it worked. Um, but it took him about 25 minutes to get everything positioned correctly, um, get the straps worked right to where it wouldn't sag down and everything else. And I just, of course, for the next three and a half miles out, all I could think of was when I get back, I got to definitely test this tar even more because I do not want to run into that when I'm using it to be a pain in the butt. Now, it could have been user error. I wasn't paying attention that much. We we split the, the elk in half. I took half. He took half. Um, and he wasn't using a Kafaru. No. No. And not saying that um, there is a... Um, Anything wrong with the pack that he was using, those packs are purposely built for a shelf. And if people choose to use that shelf, they may be okay with, you know, or they may have it down pat or it may not take as long. It's just with me, it seems so much simpler to tighten two straps at the bottom, throw my stuff in, tighten the other ones and go. Rather than detach, reattach, move a few things around and then go, it just took longer. Yep. Not saying that that's wrong. It's just not my cup of tea. And if you got good at it, maybe you go faster. If it's the first time you use the shelf or whatever. But what you're saying is you designed your pack to not be that way. <laughs> yeah. So that it's a lot. So it's pretty simple to to use as a meat shelf. Yeah. And I mean, there's times, you know, talking about Kafara, we designed something that seems like a great idea. And I'm on the side of the mountain kicking it like. <laughs> not a great idea and then it, it it comes off the design table and goes under the table like it doesn't <laughs> we had this um bright idea at one time you know what i'm not gonna even say it because we're still perfecting it but we had this bright idea for a specific item a lot of guys have asked for uh -huh. and in my mind's eye it just seemed like a great idea and then when we built it and i took it out i was like man this is the stupidest thing i've ever come up with this is a horrible idea we used it for a few days and yeah, back to the drawing board six, seven months ago. So, well, that's pretty sweet. I uh, um, I probably won't get a new pack right away, but uh, <laughs> uh, that's pretty sweet. I, I'm really curious about uh, that tar, um, especially um, given some new camo patterns you have. So tell me again, like, what are all your camo patterns? We Cause, have. Because uh, we live in a, a world, you know, of hunters who like to look good, dude. 
Yeah, we we have uh, these are solids and camo patterns. We have black Typhon, which is the 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 blackish cryptic pattern. Highlander, which is our number one seller. Mandrake, which is a, a a greener Highlander pattern, which is also from Cryptic. Fusion, which is First Lights pattern. Coyote Brown, Wolf. I think that's it. We have seven. Coyote Brown and Wolf are solids. Yeah, Coyote Brown is brown. Wolf is gray. Sweet. All right, Aaron, and what's your favorite? Color? Yeah, pattern. Color. Man, that's I like Typhon. Yeah. If but I'm I'm kind of going the route of no camo. So if I had to pick one, I would probably just wear wolf. So if, so that brings up another question uh, for you while I got you here talking. Uh, I got this this question today uh, from Charles Garcia. Is camo important? How important is it to wear camo for spot and stock bow hunting? Can a hunter wear in, wearing a natural wearing natural solid colors like brown, green, light gray be just as successful on a hunt as a hunter that is wearing camo? Does it matter which camo pattern you should wear, or is it personal preference? What's the deal? You want me to answer that one? Yeah, dude, scab at it, man. So if you um, set aside the uh, the clicks, like the <laughs> Because a, a question I get asked all the time, like leg humpers. Well, I get it all the time in the same. Uh, you know, Aaron, do you hate Kuyu? Okay, so Kuyu is a clothing company. I think Kuyu makes great clothing. Not an overly large fan of their their packs. Um, which I don't want to argue about that point. It's just, but they make great clothing. As far as the pattern goes, you can make fun of all of them. So the Kuyu thing. Because we make fun of all of them. Even the ones I wear is <laughs> I'm about to get invaded in Montana from Russians <laughs> in Red Dawn, right? Or it's right. the moo cow pattern. Fusion, <laughs> cucumber. That's the cucumber pattern. Um, and then uh, it looks like you got molested by a rattlesnake for Highlander. It mm. looks like a snake or whatever. Um, ASAT is not the prettiest pattern in the world, but it is very effective. Uh, whoa, 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 dude. People who love ASAT, it's like a cult. I Well, I just talked to Ben about introducing Kefaru packs and ASAT. But the bottom line of, of all of that <laughs> is, oh, and then Sitka gear, which we're probably going to get yelled at. <laughs> I don't even know. You may have to bleep this out, but we, the name for that is Shika. Uh, <laughs> So, so you don't have a fancy name for the actual pattern? Uh for the well, it we call it <laughs> I'm making fun of my companies too, so so nobody got all pissed off over this. We call it uh man <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we just take this offline. We call it overly marketed digital. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got <laughs> it. Because it it does and I know a little bit more about the digital, the testing and the, the, the digital testing and everything yeah. in the military. But we, it's, it's, uh, the, the, the Optifade pattern is, is highly marketed digital camo. We also call it Chitka. Um, cryptic, people call it crap tech. Um, <laughs> it goes, so you can see I'm pretty non biased on this before any haters get on here. For me, if you're a good hunter, you watch the wind and you don't move, it's probably not that important. Um, Will it help maybe 10%, 1%, 30% of the time? It could. It's probably hard to quantify that. But I would say if you're on a budget um, and you can get solid colors cheaper, um, that it's probably not a bad idea to spend the money on boots, packs, and optics, things that you're going to use a lot, whatever the case may be, and then get the camo. Now, it's been so clicky with this whole um, – camo thing that you can uh get into one hell of a debate real quick on what is better now when it comes to the pattern i personally don't get too wrapped up in the pattern for me it's the performance of the actual garment which is why you see me wear off the wall stuff nobody's ever heard of sometimes um i try not to ever support anti-hunting companies but i'm a big fan of certain 
parts and pieces of of all the companies. Um, I don't wear Kuyu very much, but all the other ones, I wear some Sitka, I wear some First Light, uh, Cryptic, and it's Swazi. I use Swazi uh, frequently. I have Black Diamond clothing, Mamut, Marmot. I, I wear a little bit of everything. I would focus more on your hunting abilities, knowing the game, um, than I would uh, being head to toe in a specific camo. Now, if it makes you feel tougher, put it on because that's important. But <laughs> I agree. If, if, I if you're agree. like ah, whatever, then I wouldn't stress out about it too much. It reminds me, like uh, I guess, as soon as you post this, my email box is going to start filling up from what <laughs> I just said. <laughs> I, give, I, I give Casey and Jordan Harbison a little crap. Uh, uh, Casey, when we were up there, he was hanging out with us a while back. He was saying, "Cannot wear mismatching camo." And I'm wearing like a different camo pattern pant, a different shirt, different hat. You know, they're all. And I, I actually see it as a, as a, as a badge of honor to be mismatched a little bit. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I just nobody owns me, right? And Casey's like, I can't stand not matching, like having everything, you know, dialed in, uh, which is so funny. So you have different, different. Uh, attitudes toward the stuff. But I think what's important, like you said, is do you feel confident in it? But yeah. more than that, I think, uh, like you said, skill is more important. Um, watching the wind is more important. All that's more important. One thing that I think does is, is even more important than all of that is, uh, what you do with your face, maybe in your hands. Yeah. I always camo my, um, my face for sure. Pretty much any photo you can see, not any, but most photos. I use a carbo mask stuff. My wife actually found it. It's um, it's better for your. You don't get zits from it, basically. So anyway, I I always camo my face. And one thing you'll notice, whether you're a, a guy behind a rifle scope at a thousand yards or a bow hunter at forty, you look through the woods at a guy moving. You don't see the camo. You don't see the solid color. You see his face and his hands. Yeah. And those are two things. And I don't. I used to get all rangered up and painted on like predator so i could feel like arnold i just smear that crap all over my face now um because it's the shine and that's one thing on some materials um well whatever i already bashed all of them so i'll just keep on going <laughs> the helios i think from cryptic the core series from first light um or not from first light from sitka first light's good because they're all merino there's a shine to i got yeah, busted but- in that in that fabric, I got busted more wearing um, a specific top from Sitka than I did any other pa- uh, any other camo, and it, it had nothing to do with the actual pattern. I don't think it was it was very shiny. Um, it's my own opinion of that. It's like, now, it's like wearing a loud garment that yeah. wrinkles or yeah. That way, I'm a not, big fan. It's of, not the pattern so much as just. The, the texture, the, the feel. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a big fan of Merino and fleece anyway, and neither one of those are shiny. And, you know, to kind of touch on as I was cra- making cracks at all the camo companies, please know it's all in good fun. Nobody get butt hurt. Um, I work with most of those companies now. It's just that in different circles, some of the circles, you can get along with everyone. We all give each other crap. You know, they can tell me I'm wearing crap deck and I can say you're wearing Ditka and hey, are you ready to go invade Montana? And we all get along. In other circles, it's a little more sensitive. Uh, and you shouldn't be that way because it's all really good camo. It's all really good products. It's just what's important to you. And there's no reason to get overly sensitive about it because it is just material. We're not curing cancer or heading to <laughs> Djibouti to save starving Africans. I, it's just clothing, right? Um, for me, my strongest suggestion I could give to anyone is Camo the face and hands, like you've said, buy the best garment you can afford, the best material. Performance wise. Worry about the pattern secondary. Um, we wear, well, first light came out with that corrugate guide pant, which I'm a huge fan of. It's nylon, dries fast, breathes really well. Um, for a little bit colder weather, like the Kuyu Attack pant is a super good pant. It's got inner zippers now that, it, that helps. Um, you know, you start looking at some of the Sitka and Cryptic pants. Um, those hold a little bit more water. They're still a very high-tech pant, but they have um, 
a little more spandex in them and they're polyester, not quite as good as nylon, but still all of those are great options. And the, the difference in today's market, it's a market of numbers, not as much as field use. Uh, n- not saying if I can say that uh, my pant performs whatever 17% better than your pant, that sounds really good, but how much of that 17% can you quantify in the field? It's pretty difficult, right? And there's some things that stand out, like the Kefaru insulating jacket. Performance-wise, you immediately know that jacket is warm. We have not had one bad review. It is a super warm and very durable and wear very wind-blocking jacket. But it doesn't compress quite as well. It doesn't, you know, it's 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 synthetic. So is it better? Like I had guys ask me, he didn't tell me what jacket was, but it was a Kuyu super down jacket. Is it warmer? Is it better? And I've got to ask 9 million questions. But in reality, if you want a really durable jacket that blocks the wind really well and can get soaking wet, you want to get the Kafaru jacket. Same with the first light, the unpronounceable, the Uncompadre. If you want the smallest, packable, lightest one, get a down jacket. You, you know what I mean? And I wouldn't worry so much about just a lot of hate in the camo industry, I guess I would say. Focus less on what 9 million chuckle puppets are telling you online to go yeah. buy this camo and just buy your best, the best garment you could afford. Yeah, definitely. There are uh, <clears throat> guys who love their certain patterns. And and uh, I'll admit, aesthetically, there are certain patterns I find ugly as sin. Like, <laughs> just, I don't, I don't like it. I don't like how it looks. And there are people who, on the other hand, on the flip side just love that stuff they put it on their car if they could i mean it's like they put everything in that camel pattern so i've learned uh <clears throat> over the years that it is mostly personal preference and yeah. i have to say the cryptic pattern does blend in really well and that the fusion blends in well too um i just guiding helping going on a lot of sheep high country mule deer and goat hunts you have a chance to be 800 yards away, let's yeah, say. Yeah. Which even at 400 yards, it's hard to pick somebody out unless they're wearing orange. But you put a guy at 400 yards away in sheep country. I won't even mean, yeah, in sheep or goat country in different patterns. You do that with non biased takeaway out, all the clicks and everything else. I'm not going to mention names. There's one pattern I guarantee you have four out there. There's one pattern you're going to be like, oh, my God. He might as well be wearing an orange BF-17 panel. That thing is horrible. And then there's going to be another pattern where you're just glued to the binos. You can't find it. And that's not my opinion. That's just, you know. Experience. Experience experience. of watching guys on, you know, because when you can't find the guy to flag him in. Yeah, that's kind of a problem, right? That <laughs> pattern is working very well. When Pinch went on that stock for the one goat, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't find him. I'm like, huh? Well, I guess I'll just start hoping that he can see me. I don't know if he can see me or not. And he literally was in the big, uh, in the middle of the biggest opening he could be in. Uh-huh. And thank God he finally started waving. He got out his dry sack and waving it because he could see I could not see him, you know. So, but I I think on my end now, probably one, I get tired of everybody arguing over camo patterns. I just wear what I want. Yeah. And that's it. Like whether it be the, you know, the dress, the, the Swazi jacket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, that thing works, right? I love their fleece too. Um you know, the the first light guide pants and their merino, very, very good. I'm a big fan of Typhon. So I like, I don't think it works very well hunting, but I'd wear Typhon on the street all the time if I could. I really like that cold front jacket from Sitka for high country stuff, like when it's raining and, and cold because it, it is waterproof and it has a fleece liner. But in, you know, truth be told, I'll probably end up with every camo company hating me at some point because I I haven't been wearing all of them exclusively all the time. Like the other day I had an icebreaker t-shirt on when we shot the goat. And then I had a first light, um, the, uh, the fleece, the waffle fleece top. Uh, and I actually, I'd had first light pants on too, but then right before that I I had a cold front Sitka jacket on. (laughs) So it just depends, you know what I mean? 
and I wear what I want. Oh, well, I think it's awesome today the way that we have all these options because, you know, I remember when Sitka first came out, uh, you know, there really wasn't much for technical garments and First Light uh, started coming out. These guys are mountaineering guys, you know, guys that, that have experience using uh, Patagonia and, and these, these other companies that are putting out real technical clothing. We didn't have that as an option in the hunting industry for a long time. I remember everything that was camo patterned was like cotton. So it's cool to have the technology we have in in uh, camo clothing today and to have these uh, these camo options. So, uh, But as far as it being a necessity and which pattern is critical and all that, that's kind of personal preference. And uh, just buy what you find aesthetically pleasing at this point. I, I, don't, I don't have a big beef in the game no i care way more about its tech its performance like how well does it breathe how well does it keep me warm what temperature ratings does it does it work you know in a 40 to 50 degree swing you know i what kind of layers options do i have you know how waterproof is it what does it take how much pressure does it take before it breaks down and leaks you know i care a lot more about that than i do the camo pattern on the garment yeah, for sure. And I mean, I think we've talked about doing like an ultimate gear list at one point in time or another. At some point in time, I'm sure I'll hurt some feelings. I'll break down all the different things um, I've found as far as what's rated. Um, a s certain jackets that, that are on the market right now that post their breathability and waterproof rating. Well, with the other companies I work with... <laughs> We've had those tested and we have found that some of those ratings are posted up before it's built. So just to simplify things, if you have the <laughs> outer layer, uh -huh. um, you know, if it says if it's a two, 2.5, three layer garment. So let's say three layers. Yep. For simplification, this center piece of paper is your breathable layer mm -hmm. this is your waterproof layer and let's say this is your inner layer or fleece layer yep uh, if you are only posting up the center portion which is the breathable if the, the center layer this is the breathability layer and the waterproof layer whatever yep if you're only posting the breathability ratings off this layer before it's all glued together and camouflaged you are a liar that is not correct <laughs> And we have found that a lot of the companies, I will say, I, I will say three companies that are very honest, uh, Sitka being the most honest, First Light being right there with them, Cryptic being within a percent of what they posted, which is basically they're all telling the truth. Those companies were extremely accurate. In fact, Sitka's was a little below what they post actually tested a little higher than what they posted. Um, you can have these tests done at a private company. You just hand them and they send no. it back the, the, the results. So when I hear people say this jacket rates way better than your jacket, I have to be quiet and think the center portion did. But now that we're on the mountain using it, we're on a level playing field because it actually is all put together now and it doesn't breathe worth the crap. Um, yeah, yeah. I won't go into any more detail than that. <laughs> Very interesting. We were talking about this the other day with uh, with tents or packs, uh, and how people say this this tent weighs uh, three pounds when really it's five. Like yeah. they they left out a bunch of the uh, equipment that you would normally. Isn't there kind of an industry standard on on how that's done, and how does how does Kafaru do it? We weigh everything um, for the most part. I mean, if we lack on anything, our numbers are a little bit – most of our packs are weighed with everything on there. We try to be as honest as we can. And, and a lot of backpack companies, some of them do that and some of them just post the, the lightest possible option, um, which is fine too. But, um, you know, if you have a a tent and it's 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 got a package weight and a trail weight, let's say – Somewhere in the middle is the actual weight you'll need to make that tent stand up. Um, you know what I mean? Like you can yeah. figure out your own home brew of how many stakes you want to to use or whatever. Some companies are extremely honest, which Hilleberg's very honest. 
That's why they're so dang heavy. They actually tell the truth. Other companies, not so much. You, you get that tent, you actually weigh it. It's going to be heavier than it actually says. So for the most part, like at Kafara, we try to air to the high side because we don't want to be liars. And we've been off on some stuff where, you know, we're not always perfect by any means. But I have gotten a kick out of some of the products, whether it be spotting scopes, tripods, camera gear, or jackets. They obviously on some of the jackets, when they posted the weight, it was of a small because when I got my large in, it was significantly heavier than what it was tested as. And so luckily, some of the companies now are saying this was weighed. This was a large garment we weighed for the specs. Uh, so it's a realistic because a small compared to a, an extra large in a, oh, I don't know, a rain jacket, it could gain three ounces, four ounces. And if you're an ounce counting weight weenie trying to figure out the lowest you can go, that can be extremely swayed. If you're a large ounce counting weight weenie, you're gaining three to four pounds of total pack weight if everyone lied on their or not lie, everyone weighed a small, you're gaining a pound or two. Right. Interesting. Okay. Well, we have gone down uh, some serious tangents here, um, away from our topic of, uh, sh of um, ethical shot distance. Um, Maybe we'll hit that on another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's like two in a row where we, we uh, didn't actually get to the topic planned. Um, uh, yeah, we're, we're up on an hour now. Um, I think it's been a productive discussion, natural, flowing, productive discussion. <laughs> I got to go get my calves massage. Remember, I've got calf issues and yeah. I've got to go. I got to meet that deadline. I can't miss that. So uh, you're getting some electroshock. So I have overdeveloped calves and I'm a toe walker, which is bad because my calves ball up like crazy. So I have two big knots in them. I can hardly walk downstairs right now because we've been hitting cardio really hard. Yep. So they're going to do um, electroshock therapy to try to loosen them up as well as massage therapy. I've never done this, so we'll see if it works. I've done it like um, my uh, – I had some problems with my low back and uh, I herniated a disc and stuff, did some work. And the, the some of those muscles would just lock up. Um, it was back, you know, in my early 30s and uh, – late twenties where I was playing a lot of basketball and I really didn't take care of my body that well, just yeah. beat the crap out of it. And, uh, I was pretty weak actually thinking I was fit. Um, you know, I did a bunch of triathlons and I could run like crazy and ride bikes and swim and play basketball and all that. Um, but, uh, you give me a bar and do a deadlift and I could barely lift hardly any weight, you know? Yeah. And, so there's a lot more that goes into overall fitness than just – you can be a, a, a great at a triathlon and still have no muscle. Yep. I mean – and it's just – without that stabilization, you could get injured. Anyway, I, I hurt my back. and But they put that shock thing on those muscles because they just would just lock. And then uh, it would just do that zap, zap, zap every couple seconds for like 15 minutes. And then the next day, it, well, like later, it would just, then they do their chiropractor and their massage and work out the soft tissue. And uh, after a few rounds of that, dude, it was like I could move again. It made a huge difference for me. So hopefully it does the same for you. Yeah, when they looked at them, they were funny when they made the appointment. They were, they told me literally, they said, stop flexing your calf. And I said, I swear to God, I'm not. And they were like, really? And they were. They're like, it's hard as a rock. You got problems. And I was like, yeah, man, it's bad. So both um, where the calf comes down and then kind of makes a bump back up and down, there's two giant knots there that will not loosen up on both my both my calf muscles. So. Yeah, they, they kind of told me that uh, the the electrostatic or whatever you call it, the, the, the shock therapy was kind of the last resort to, to try to uh, – and it bruises it, it, it. They're like the guy puts it on there and he comes back after 15 minutes and he goes, well, this is about 10 minutes longer than I've ever left this on somebody uh, because <laughs> <laughs> the, these are these muscles are really jacked. They're really tight. And then he worked him some more. and He's like, yeah, we're gonna have to try this some more. He goes, are you going to be OK with being really bruised tomorrow? 
And I'm like, sure. <laughs> so <laughs> he stuck him back on there and did it for a while longer. And yeah, the next day it was really sore, but the muscle uh, relaxed and you just got to, I guess, drink a lot of water and, and continue to, to stretch it. But dude, yeah, you've got to like break it loose. I mean, those knots, it's kind of a vicious cycle. It's like the, once they're there, you, you've pushed it to the point where you need extreme help, Aaron. The goat didn't help packing out the goat straight up. Yeah. My calves were, they were screaming. You were on a lot of hills this year. Yeah. Steep, steep, steep hills. I mean, yeah, for a fat a kid, I've been abused. <laughs> All right, dude. Well, is there anything else uh, you want to mention or bring up? On no, today's, just because uh, we're running. Tangent podcast. We're running out of time. Just know that, um, me poking fun of everyone is all in good fun. Um, all the companies that I've mentioned make great clothing, and uh, it's just me making fun of the industry, so to speak. So don't get your panties in a bunch. <laughs> all right. And uh, there were some people who emailed me a while ago saying that they couldn't find the show notes to like a couple of podcasts like yours, Aaron, on um, what's in your pack and some of those early podcasts because they dropped off the website, but we got that fixed. So – all those podcasts are back on the site. You can always listen to them on iTunes or watch them on YouTube, but the show notes are only found on the website. So a few podcasts like the backpack one where we talk about all that gear, you know, all that gear is on that show note list with links to, to those products. Um, you're probably running completely different stuff now cause it's been six months and that's how you roll. But, um, it was good enough six months ago, so it's probably good enough today. <laughs> Actually, I think it was only four months ago. I'm so. constantly testing, but I always end up – I think when we do the uh, kind of an ultimate gear list type of a thing, yeah, the top three in every category are what I'm always using when the rubber meets the road. Yeah. So one of those three things will be good, and we'll do that podcast at some point. Okay, the, the other podcast that we're going to do down the road so people know, Navigation Orienteering, we'll get to this shot. Uh, ethical shot distance. I, we want, I want to do one on shot placement, especially since I'm uh, doing a lot of, uh, you're, you've been doing a lot of steep angle shooting and stuff. And I'm, I'm doing some blacktail from tree stand, stuff like that. And I'd also like to touch on blood trailing, which has been done before, but I want to kind of give our, our spin on that. And, um, a couple more topics that, uh, hunting out West, that was a huge one. I mean, we're just getting tons of people, um, flatlanders sending notes in saying, Hey guys, uh, can you talk about a guy coming out for the first time out West? And I think there's a lot of great podcasts on that already. Um, I think, uh, wired to hunt Mark Kenyon has brought up some of that stuff. And I think Steven Ranella has too. And, uh, um, I just had an article for Eastman's on that exact subject. that will be out too, but I think hitting it will be good. Cause some people have a false sense of hope of what they may run into. I did too many Primos videos is the problem. Television <laughs> is the problem. Um, yeah. yeah, we'll cover that at some point too. So anyway, that's in, in the, in the work. So, all right, folks, thanks for joining us today, Aaron. <laughs> enjoy your shock therapy and uh, stay gritty. All right. All right. Bye. All right, friends. Thanks for listening and supporting the podcast. Don't forget about our deal with mountain ops type in the word gritty at checkout and get 20% off until the end of the year. For those of you who have not seen the full draw film tour this year and want to go check out their website for their tour schedule. And if you haven't done so go and subscribe to our YouTube channel or to the gritty Bowman TV podcast on iTunes or Podbean, So you can see all the latest video content we have produced and be sure to have a look at the new elk 101 website where you can find our podcast and other great elk hunting content. Thank you for taking the time to leave us your feedback. We really appreciate your sincere support of our show. Finally, let me leave you with this quote by President Theodore Roosevelt, who in 1905 said, In a civilized and cultivated country, wild animals only continue to exist at all when preserved by sportsmen. The excellent people who protest against all hunting and consider sportsmen as enemies of wildlife are ignorant of the fact that in reality, the genuine sportsman is by all odds the most important factor in keeping the larger and more valuable wild creatures from total extermination. Friends, always take the time to educate those around you about your role as a hunter in preserving the wild creatures of this world. If you don't, who will? 
As always, good luck on your hunts and stay gritty. This is Ty Stubblefield, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. Gritty Bowman. <laughs>